Um, we're going to do a seminar on climbing Mount Rainier tonight. So uh, I have a couple things for your enjoyment. I'm not referring specifically to the Snickers bars on the table, but we will use those later on if you really want them. If you really want them after I've mangled them, then you can you can eat them. All right. um, but we have a map and a book and another map and a book, so you can pass those around as you wish. Um, so what we're going to try to do is we're going to present exclusively on the camera and see how that works on picking up my sound and um, also the presentation. So uh, we've met each other. Um, some of you have been to Mount Rainier before, show of hands. One. All right. The rest of you wish to go there sometime. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, we'll talk about all aspects of the mountain. Um, we just had a team come back last week. Uh, I was part of that team, and we climbed two different routes in the mountain, and I'm going to highlight those routes as well as a couple others that are uh, often climbed and favorites of Rainier climbers. And we'll go through some fun stuff too, some maps, and I've also got a little bit of a, a presentation on glaciers and also on gear. And then we can uh, take questions too. So this is for you guys. So let's go to the next slide. I'll try to keep it exciting as I can, being a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> You're doing great, man. I got some great visuals, some of our, some from our trip and some off the internet. And so hope you enjoy the pictures I picked out. So Mount Rainier, if you're familiar with it, is the tallest peak in Washington state. It's also um, the most heavily glaciated peak in the lower 48. Um, 14,410 feet, and it rises really far above the surrounding terrain, so its prominence is way up there in the single digits in the United States. Um, it's like 10,000 feet of prominence above the surrounding terrain. So Shasta is close, um, but Rainier is, is higher. Um, also, it's got way more glaciers than any other mountain of any comparable size. So 25, or I heard 26, I'm not sure which is true, but 25 glaciers. So um, it's a beast, and it's big. Um, Want to go to the next one there, let me see. Okay. Um, it, considering its size, it's one of the world's most massive volcanoes. So um, Shasta is, is comparable in terms of land area, but for Rainier, in terms of actual mass, it's far bigger. It's, most volcanoes like Shasta and the historic Mount Hood, I'm sorry, the historic St. Helens and the present Mount Hood are shaped like this. And Rainier is shaped like this. Does anybody know why? Uh, the type of volcano was... Uh yeah, something there's like two different times. It's a it's a strato volcano. They're all the same types of volcanoes, but why isn't Rainier shaped like this? Because it already blew up. That's right, a number of times. So it used to be shaped like this, but the top got blown off, therefore making it shaped like this. So it's more of a rounded dome. Now, if you look closely at it, you'll see it's got three points: Point Success, Columbia Point, and Liberty. Point, point Liberty, I think, Liberty Cap, yeah. that's what it is. So essentially it's got three types of summits, but this is the true summit here. And and uh, yes, how nice that it's a beautiful crater here, see that? So if you extend this, you'll note that it would be about at least 2,000 feet taller. We'll talk about that later. So um, yeah, it's about three miles high, um, and you can see it for over 100 miles. Has anybody flown to Seattle before? No? I'm the only one? Oh, you guys have to. Okay. Did you get a chance to see it out the window? You did? Okay. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. All right. So uh, let's go to the next one. Um, some fun things about Mount Rainier. Um, one of them that I like to tout is that at one, one time it did have the world's record for snowfall, which is 93 feet. <laughs> so... It was so tall that it buried, it buried the end of paradise, you know, up to the last story. So, um, also on the summit, because it's got active steam vents up here, it's got the world's largest glacier ice caves. There's about two miles of tunnels up there. Wow. So when we were up there just this last week, for the first time I actually noticed where those begin. There's actual steam vents coming out on the south side of the crater. And if you climb down inside those, and go down below the ice, there's actually a glacial lake down there. It's about 16 feet deep, pretty big. It's a meltwater lake in the summit crater. Wow. 
Um, there's a bunch of things that have happened on Marineer um, that are fun to talk about. Um, there's been all kinds of escapades, people climbing it in different ways, and um, you know, stories of the first ascent pioneers. There's some tragic things too. There's been a number of people who've died in the mountain. 58 people have died in the mountain since we've been keeping stats. The largest um, was a 1946 military plane crash that killed 34 Marines. It crashed into the South Tahoma Glacier. And that plane is still there, along with all of the occupants. Wow. Slowly, they were there entombed in that, yeah, 1946. Is that 56 people that have died, including a 34? I mean, it's just a 34. Uh, I, gosh, that's a good question. No, I think that's just climbers. Um, but I could be wrong. I mean, it's not a huge number, but it averages about two deaths per year. Right. Um, there have been some other tragedies I'll talk about along with all the other stuff. But this is all part of the picture of what makes Mount Rainier what it is. Um, world famous for its meadows and um, just having breathtaking scenery. And I grew up in the area uh, 50 miles from Mount Rainier, and I visited as a boy and um, moved away during my teen years to the other side of the state. When I returned as an adult, I got my ch first chance to climb it in 2002 after I've been staring at it for 20 years. So it works on you. Um, it's a monumental presence in the Northwest. Um, people just call it the mountain because it's so huge, it just dominates everything. And when you get there, you'll note that, and you get close enough, it just fills the sky and it's too big to see at a certain point. So it's a pretty amazing mountain. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Um, how about climbing though? There's, let's talk about that. So a lot of people look at it from afar, a few hardy souls choose to climb it, and so between eight and 15,000 average, about 10,000 people attend it annually. But the success rate's only 50%. So why do you think that is? <laughs> Would it be because they're not fit? Yes, that yes. could be it. Yes. And yes. what else? Uh, maybe run out of time and weather. Weather, yeah. right. So those two combined, yeah make it a tough nut to crack. Um, it creates its own weather. It sticks up 10,000 feet in the atmosphere, and it's less than 100 miles from the ocean, if you consider the Puget Sound of the ocean. Yeah. Anyway, it's not very far away from big bodies of water, and so all those storms coming off the Pacific just slam into it and dump a lot of snow on it, which is why it's got really huge glaciers, creates its own weather, and it can snow any time of year, including whiteouts, you know, even in August. So all of that makes for a pretty compelling scene for an attempt. Let's go ahead here. So um, some other things about the park um, that are related to its, uh, you know, just fun facts related to its um, origination as the, you know, the end point of our desires is that it was made a national park in 1899. So it's been well over 100 years that people have recognized the value of the mountain and its beauty. And it was an um, uh, American president who said we have to we have to keep this, you know, preserved. Um, I think it was Mr. McKinley and uh, John Muir climbed it early on, as did some other people. And so it's pretty uh, astounding that it was made a national park so quickly. Um, the state of Washington wasn't even ten years old at that point, so it was quickly decided it was an important landmark. Um, some other disasters that have happened on it, um, two others I'll mention now um, you might want to know about. One of them was in 1981, there was an avalanche on the Ingram Glacier, which actually killed a world-famous climber, Willie Unsold, who was a professor at the University of, um, I forget the name of it, it's in Olympia, um, at the university there in Olympia, and he had his students with him. This was after he had pioneered a route on Everest. So. Surprisingly so, Matt Rainier took out an Everest veteran <laughs> and his students. So um, also in the 2014, which is obviously just last year, you might have heard about um, some climbers that perished on Liberty Ridge. Um, all they know is that they, they called in on a sat phone at 12,000 feet and they weren't heard from for three or four days. Well, they weren't heard from again. Um, that was three or four days before they figured out that something was wrong and that they were dead. Um, most likely what happened is a, a huge Serac collapsed and swept them away in an avalanche down onto the Carbon Glacier about 3,000 feet below. They did find uh, three of the four bodies now and some tents and avalanche beacon parts and stuff, but not all of them have been recovered. 
And it was a guided group. So it was two guides and four clients. One of them happened to be the vice president of Intel, I think. Wow. Um, if I'm, if this is not some <laughs> crazy story. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it happens. Um, yeah. Every year there's people who do die. And, you know, it's, it's a hazardous place, but that's part of its beauty. So let's go to the next one. So how about some geology? Here's Volcano 101. So, um, you know, uh, the volcanoes are hotspots on Earth's crust. And the ring of fire, which Mount Rainier is a part of, is created when crustal plates override one another. So the continental plate is riding over the oceanic plate. And as it dives into, this, into the Earth, it creates magma, which swells up and creates essentially a blister on the Earth's surface. And when the crust um, can't withstand that weight anymore, then explodes into lava, ash, pumice, and continues to do so, and it vents all that amazing energy it's on inside the middle of the earth or on the on the crustal underneath the crustal plate so half a million years ago there is still already a base of lava spewed there by previous volcanoes the spot upon upon which mount rainier stands now became more active and had thousands of eruptions so it built this cone up to about sixteen thousand feet lava ash pumice you know pyroclastics of the, of these types of volcanoes which are anticide volcanoes is sticky uh, sort of lava. So it'll build up and become crusty and then it'll explode catastrophically, just like Mount St. Helens did. Versus the other type of basaltic volcanoes like in Hawaii, which have a different type of lava that's more flowy. Yeah. Those are shield volcanoes and they, they you know, they vent a lot, they vent a lot and the volcano flows down their sides. So more you these big shield volcanoes. Yeah. But these andesite volcanoes, which have different rock materials tend to form these sharp cone shaped things. So it did have a nice cone. Um, it was up at 16,000 feet, then glaciers and time and more eruptions um, blew that away. And then about 2,000 years ago, it rebuilt to its current height and it last erupted only about a century ago. However, it has had um, major mud flows, which are called lahars along the way. So we'll go to that next. A lahar is an instance in which a mountain suddenly um, superheats um, by an eruption and melts a glacier that's on its side. So that glacier turns into a huge flood that's vertically poised to create massive amounts of damage. So the glacier simply melts in an instant and rushes down, becomes mud, and takes all kinds of dirt and rock with it and just goes with all the energy it, it has contained in it until it dissipates in the floodplain. So this is, of course, not a real picture. This is just a dynamic that um, the U.S. Geological Survey put together. But it's a huge threat to the communities that live around Mount Rainier. And um, when it has a lahar mud flow like the Osceola and the Electron, which wasn't too long ago, it actually reaches the Puget Sound. And many portions of the Puget Sound that were once, once deeper channels have actually been filled in from mud flows from Mount Rainier. And actually, where those places are now, the communities are presently building homes and building roads and having schools with elementary school kids. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so towns like Puyallup and Ording and so on that I grew up around, they have a volcano evacuation system where you really only have about 15 minutes. If Mount Rainier erupted and Al-Lahar would inevitably resolve, um, they would be swallowed in hundreds of feet of mud and water in a short period of time. So go to high ground is their advice. This one particularly, the electron mud flow buried the valley in Ording with mud and trees and debris about 600 feet deep and when they Whoa. dug down they found old growth cedars that low that had been snapped off at the base 500 years ago and buried in a 600 foot grave so it's it's pretty amazing place around that mountain let's go to the next one um so of course native americans lived in the area for thousands of years they had some really fantastical names um, like muckleshoot and nisqually and so on and most of the glaciers and the areas around there were named after them but typically, it was it's accepted that they call the mountain Tahoma. So, with of course, you know, the arrogance that that the early people had <laughs> when Captain Vancouver see it for the first time, he didn't know it was called that, but he named it after his rear admiral, who was Brit, whose name happened to be Rainier, who also was an enemy to America and never liked the United States. Never put set foot on it again. <laughs> How appropriate! <laughs> so there is a sort of a movement that's still alive to rename the mountain what it had traditionally been called, which is Tahoma, just like Mount McKinley is now called Benali. I would love to have that, but 
in the in the interim, it's still called Mount Rainier, right? and it's attached to a national park, which is you know, so we'll live with that for the time being. But uh, Mount Rainier came to being, and as its current name, in 1870, Stevens uh, Hazard Stevens and Van Trump climbed it with the help of an Indian guide who was certain that they would die on the summit. Um, and when he came, when they came back, he thought they were ghosts and ran from them. You've heard this story over and over. It's happened. <laughs> uh, in 1888, the Soviet John Muir climbed Mount Rainier, and um, one quote that he was interested that he said was that the mountain is best appreciated from below. That's what he says. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe yeah. it was just a little too crazy up there. Yeah. Um, Faye Fuller in in 1890 was the first woman to climb the mountain. This was a uh, long time before that was even accepted for anybody. <laughs> and she did it in a dress, and she climbed many other mountains, too. She, she was quite the mountaineer. Here's a picture of an early, uh, probably 1910, 1920s ascent of, of the Nisqually Glacier. You see they have uh, steel-tipped um, alpenstocks. The women are in dresses with hats, appropriately clad. And uh, obviously, nobody has harnesses, ropes, helmets, or GPSs. Or even they just have big long, <laughs> the big long sticks. The big long ice, ice axe. Maybe. They might have. They might it's have hobnails. That's right. <laughs> so, oh look, I put that in twice. 1899 it was made national parks. Yeah. Okay. So, what does it take? Well, um, I'm not the foremost authority in Rainier, but I've been there five times and I've summoned three. <laughs> And that compiled with evidence and books I've read said that the number one thing that holds people back is they didn't prepare for the uh, endurance they need cardiovascular to make it to the top. So straight up fitness. And it's not just having a big set of lungs. You need to be strong. Your legs need to be real strong to be a backpack carrying machine. Because it's a long way to the top. It's about 9,000 feet on the standard route to get there. Um, Route finding is important because it makes its own weather, like I mentioned, and you can become enveloped in clouds and snow and lose your way. So, and it's so large that it's difficult to um, get back on track if you don't really know where you're going or have poor navigational skills. Um, you'll need snow and ice climbing, of course, depending on which route you take. You want to be comfortable with crampons and ice axe. And every route requires glacier travel and self-rescue. So. You have to have that as a prerequisite for getting on the mountain. So, grab my, I have my, my phone on automatic. Good, good you, you, skills you, walking about across you, you, the two by twelves, right? What's that? <laughs> good skills walking across the two by twelve. Right, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's bridges up there. I'll show you some of those. <laughs> so like I said, it's a nine thousand foot climb. You you simply cannot not prepare for it and just expect to get up there. Um, you need to keep going for at least 12 hours and on this, the, the climb that we were on recently it took us about 18 hours. So you know it can be that long, sometimes it's shorter, but it's you can expect a long day. Um, to do this you'll want to prepare by running, biking, swimming two to three times a week and that's probably a good regimen to have for all mountain climbing. So perhaps that's something you could, you know, if you're going to climb Rainier, that you can just build into your schedule. And, you know, at 14,000, when you've got less oxygen than down below, you'll feel it. So it's not just the fitness, but the fact that you've got less power and you're going to be tired. So it can compile, it can compound on you to make it a difficult descent. This, this is a picture of the DC route, which is Disappointment Cleaver. Uh, this is Little Tahoma right here. And these folks still have about 2,000 feet to go at this point. So go ahead and go to the next one. So how about a few regulations? Um, I believe we paid $47 for a climbing pass. Wow. <laughs> That's uh, Yeah. And it has to be arranged uh, ahead of time. So you'll need to contact the park um, early in late winter, but early before the climbing season, and um, get a permit. There is a lottery now for the DC route. 90% um, of all the climbers go up on that route. So if you wish, choose a different route. That's my advice. Um, and I'll show you some other options. Um, you not only have to get your permit, but you have to register with the National Park Service. Town. Everything you're carrying, your vehicle, your license plate, your itinerary, when you're leaving, returning, what sort of equipment you have with you, emergency numbers, names, and everyone who's going, 
and they do a good job of keeping track of the climbers in the mountain. So it's a little bit of paperwork, but it's worthwhile. Um, they have a great system there for helping people stay safe. So you uh, have to carry a blue, you have to carry, filling it is optional for you, but you have to carry a blue bag. <laughs> if you have to deposit something on the mountain, it should go in the blue bag. And then you bring that back down to Katmere and get rid of it. Um, but please keep the mountain clean. Um, there are um, thousands of people climb it every, every year, and they pull tons of human waste off of Camp Muir that's been deposited in the blue bag. So that's just something that we have to do because there's so much, because we love the mountain so much. There's so many people there. Um, anytime you're camping in this area, you need a wilderness permit. And if you, anytime you go above 10,000 feet, even if you're not climbing, you need to have a climbing permit. And I strongly recommend reservations so that you can get your site. There are no reservations at Camp Muir. You just have to take it if you can get it. So you'll have to carry tents anyway. There's no way you can assure that you have a bunk at Camp Muir. Go ahead and the next one. So topographically, I'll try to point out a couple things. The crater is actually two different craters that intersect. Okay, Here's Point Success, here's Liberty Cap, and that's Columbia Point, which is the west rim of the crater. You'll see a number of glaciers um, here that are, some are longer than others, so I'll show you a couple. And as we uh, go to the next slide, I'll try to help you somewhat get an image of what Mount Rainier looks like. It's, to, to, it's topography, because that's really important to everybody, specifically climbers. You're going to have to know how to navigate it. You need to know what the structure is. So to orient yourself, there's only two visitor centers. One of them is Paradise, and the other one is Sunrise, here. And of course, they come from different sides of the park. Okay. There's a Wonderland Trail, which goes all the way around it. It's about 90 miles. There's an amazing backpacking circuit, which you like to do someday when I'm too old to climb. Uh, no, numerous waterfalls and campgrounds, most notably on this side, this arc here. Um, so Paradise is the celebrated center that has all the wildflowers and so on, but Sunrise is just spectacular. It's just not as convenient to get to. Uh, on this side of the mountain, you start with the Nisqually Glacier, which used to reach all the way to Paradise in the 50s, had some ice caves right about here. And that's the one that's, uh, these glaciers on the south side here received the most sun and shrinkage over the last, well, half century or more. And no surprise, since they're on the south, they'll receive that. That's because you know there's less snow and more sun here, like all mountains in North America. The other one next to it would be the uh, Cowlitz here and the Ingram here. This is the Emmons, which is the largest mass okay, of uh, snow and ice. Although it doesn't reach as low as the others, um, this one here is the carbon, uh, right, up, right below the Willis Wall. We've got Malwich, we've got Puyallup, we've got Tahoma, South Tahoma. This is the Couts right here. So, um, just to give you an orientation on some of the most popular routes, Mount Rainier's uh, Camp Muir is right here at 10,000 feet, and the route goes through here. The Emmons starts here and comes up on the Emmons Winthrop to here. The Couts starts, well, here or there, and goes up the Couts Glacier to here. Liberty Ridge, which is another advanced route, um, goes up right about here to Liberty Cap and then to the summit. And the Tahoma and Success, Mowich, and all the others on this side, which are the abandoned, lonely side mountain, we'll go through those in turn. Let's go to the next one. So here's a close-up of Mount Rainier. I love stuff like this. So Columbia Crest, 14410. This crater is about a mile long. So if you get up here, it's, you're like, I'm not at the top. You have to walk all the way across this cone. Um, Disappointment Cleaver was so named because they thought they were near the top when they saw it. And um, it, ironically, that's the route that a lot of people do get disappointed on because 90% of them climb that route and only half of them make it. So here they are again at Camp Muir. Let's see, Cowlitz, Camp Muir right here. They're going to go through Cathedral Gap to the Ingram, up to D.C. I'm sorry, that, that's, that's Little Tahoma. Go through the Gap on the Ingram, up to Disappointment Cleaver, and then up the upper sections to the top. So Emmons Winthrop, here's Camp Sherman on the north side and the Interglacier there. 
Winthrop, Carbon, Mowich, Edmonds, North Mowich, Piala, Tahoma, South Tahoma, Cows, right here. And then Wilson is a small little guy between the Nisqually and the Cows. So our teams, once again, they climb DC. We, I've done the Edmonds, and I'll talk about that. Liberty Ridge is over here. I gotta pay real close attention to this one. I think it's Ptarmigan. It should be right about there. Yeah. Okay, up to Liberty Cap. Um, these all have various names and they're not very popular. But then here's the Cowitz again. This is that infamous ice shoot I'll tell you about in a minute. And the ice cliff on the Cowitz is here, which is very prominent from down below. So that's enough for now. I'll, I'll go through this all again. So go to the next slide. So let's talk about the popular route, Disappointment Cleaver. Um, I already told you, I already gave you this fact a number of times. Um, it is 9,000 feet of ascent, and it's just snow and glacier climbing. It's not really ice, and there's a, quite a bit of rock to traverse, too. So I have a picture here, which should be useful. Let's go ahead and follow along. You're going to start at Paradise, which is about 5,000 feet, approximately. And you're going to come up to Camp Muir, which is 10,200, right here in this nice little saddle. This is where the real glaciers begin. This is the cowlitz here. It isn't much of a, of a um, barrier, and it's not very heavily crevassed, which is lucky because um, this is your first day, so you're going to get up here as early as you can, and go to sleep, and about the time you start feeling tired, you're going to wake up and start climbing the mountain, which is going to be between 10 and 2. And uh, the next leg, of, which is summit day, you're going to go up the cowlitz through Cathedral Gap, and on to Ingram Flats, which is a huge, very broken glacier here. Very uh, impressive. There's a couple different routes. This one is the Emmons variation. I don't know that people do that very often. Uh, this one is the Ingram Direct, which would certainly be very crevassed. The normal route goes up on the flats and then crosses over to Disappointment Cleaver and climbs up the dirt and rocks, doling your crampons in the process all the way to the top. Um, this is point break up here where the mountain starts to ease back a little bit. And then, of course, the, the summit crater and the actual summit here. You can see in this, in this picture, here's Point Success and Liberty Cap. So um, once you get to the top, you're only halfway there. Then you have to come all the way back down to Camp Muir. And then some people go all the way back to Paradise that same day, which is a long day, but maybe you don't want to spend a second night in a stone hut with other smelly climbers. I understand. So... One great thing about the DC route is that it's maintained by the guide services. So that makes it possible for people with very little glacier travel experience to get up on the mountain. And all of the hazards are marked. And if the snow bridges have fallen in, they'll put ladders over them for you, which we found out this last week. <laughs> so it's a great route to go up on the mountain. And um, because of the fact that it's maintained by guide services, it's, um, it's really a less dangerous route than it would otherwise be. However, there's an edge that is taken off of that because it's not truly a wild, it's not a really a wilderness route and you aren't really doing your own navigation. Okay, I just have one question. So question, you, yeah. you went across actual ladders? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I actual know, like, ladders. Boards, but they put some ladders in there, wow. They put ladders and they strap boards to the top of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's still a ladder that's, you know, aluminum, about this wide. All right. And uh, just with the yawning crevasse right below you. And then they put the board on top of it, so that makes it a little easier. A little easier. Rooms, yeah. yeah, occasionally they even have a hand line on two of them, I believe. Yeah. There was a line hanging on two, but still, well, you, you can go oh, slow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so let's look at the next. So I'll take you through how to get there. This one is okay, I guess. Um, so Paradise Valley down here. You're going to start in the wonderland of paradise amongst all the wildflowers and alpine silver fir and move your way up through uh, lots of amazing scenery up on the snow. And then walk some um, somewhat uninteresting snow slopes all the way to Camp Mirror, which is not really crossing excuse me, any glaciers, but um, you will be going through hazardous terrain nonetheless, and people have actually died on the way to and from Camp Mir. <laughs> so there's been whiteouts and people have fallen in crevasses, so they are there, but um, typically the, the danger doesn't really begin until after you're there. So you said that we don't want to cross any, any glaciers, but uh, those crevasses? Mm -hmm. The crevasses are right here, 
in the Nisqually. So what happens is people get off route, fall down the cliffs, or detour in the Nisqually, and then they fall in a crevasse. So yeah, there aren't any crevasses on the right route, <laughs> but it's easy to get off route because there's virtually no landmarks, just piles of rock here and there that all look alike. So, but I would recommend if you ever get up there and you don't have uh, the ability or you're, the party you're with won't allow you to really climb the mountain, at least go to Cameo. That's a oh, great yeah. view. So let's go to the next one. So here's some pictures from our trip, and obviously this one is not, but um, this is uh, our party heading up. Um, you know, the well-maintained trails and the views like this the whole way are just breathtaking. And then uh, we, we elected to set up tents in, in camp there, and the weather was amazing. Um, this is the sort of wildflower display that you'll, you're going to see there. You've never seen an alpine meadow like this. So um, a, a, a great day's hike nonetheless. Okay, here's a picture of one of the stone huts at Camp Muir at 10,000 feet. And uh, it's uh, built well, quite a while ago. It must have been like around World War II or so. Um, and it sleeps about 25 people. Um, the guide services have their own guide hut there where they mount water for their clients and where they stay. Um, it's got three toilets, two of them were operational when we were there. And they're building some new structures. So crazy you know it's a, it's so high but it's got a great um, place where you can actually sit down and do your business that's amazing to have that mm -hmm. and uh, but however there's no water so you have to um, boil your or melt your own snow so you got to bring fuel up there in the stove and you get a few hours sleep then go to the next one then you leave in the middle of the night and why well because with so much glacier that you have to traverse, you want to make sure that the crevasses are nice and solid and that the weather won't be coming in. So most people leave, we left around one, the 2012 when SMC climbed it, and I think they left around that same time a week ago and we went back there again. And so much of this you're going to be climbing in the dark. Normally the sun won't really start clearing until you're already uh, all the way up here. So you're going to cross the Cowlitz, Cathedral Gap, and all massive crevasses on the Ingram in the darkness. And so one thing I'd recommend is you have a really good headlamp so you can see where you're going. And secondly, that you, um, if you're going to be on this route, but of course you pay close attention to where the trail goes of all the other hundreds of people that have been there before you. Um, you're going to have to rope up from the very beginning. So the entire route you're going to be doing attached to two or one or two or three other people. So you're, you're going to want to practice how to travel on a glacier before you get to this point. So if you're a member of SMC, you can take glacier travel courses through us, of course, and um, we can help you get prepared for that. All right, let's go to the next one. So here's some, some great photos. This was taken last week. What are these up here? These are tents. This is the this is the camp at Ingram Flats, and this is what lies below them. Wow! I mean, it's just incredible. So it's like about two, three hundred feet. I mean, let's see. It's huge, yeah. So each one of these dark bands here is the is the dust that blows in the summer. So this is a winter's snowpack. This is the winter before and the winter before. Wow! So I'm only seeing a few winters worth there, um, but it gets more and more compacted as it goes down. And wow! It's really broken up. Yeah. It is, and uh, many of the crevasses we crossed were that deep, you know, where you, you'd look down and it'd be at least 100 feet. Yeah. So pretty inspiring. <laughs> inspiring is keep your balance. Um, here's above the Ingram on your way up. Um, this is probably above the Cleaver. I'm not sure if this was taken by the DC team, but this is Mount Tahoma in the background, which is a remnant of the, of the historic Mount Rainier. Um, if it were a mountain in its own right, it would be the third highest in the state. So, but as it is, it's a, it's just a remnant of, of the summit. So it, it broke off and slid down, but it's a nice sharp piece of the mountain you get to climb by. It's really scenic. You can see here that uh, even in you know uh, mid July, the glacier's really broken up. So they've had a drought up there recently, and in the last couple of years, their snowfall hasn't been up to par. So the glaciers have suffered, and when that occurs, gravity still works in them in the same way. They don't have the same mass they had before, and when it's warmer, they also slide further. So that creates more cracks than ever. 
So as a result, um, the DC route is more broken and more um, all over the place than it's been in many years. When I talked to some folks who are associated with RMI, um, they said that it's, it usually doesn't look this way until September. So this is mid-July. So it's at least a month and a half ahead of schedule. So they may not, might not even make it to September this year, I don't know. Um, I counted six ladders and we came down the DC route. And when the first time we climbed it in 2012, there was one. So it's changed quite a lot. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Some pictures of the crazy terrain that the climbers are going through nowadays, lots of seracs and steep stuff, um, walking narrow fins between huge crevasses on each side, and uh, lots of safety lines and ladders to get them to the top. So um, another interesting feature about this mountain, about this route, is that there's so many people that, that climb this route that actually in some, place, some places creates a ditch uh, that is fairly deep. So you can see here, there's quite a pathway worn in the snow. Um, the weather often comes and goes. You'll be in blazing sunshine, and then a big swath of clouds will come through, and you're just enveloped in mist for who knows how long. So this happens periodically during the day. Go ahead and head up. So here's some more scale for you. Obviously, climbers on the slope. Um, below or above a yawning crevasse with the cloud deck down here at about 10,000 feet. So it's quite spectacular. Quite spectacular that way. The summit crater itself is kept relatively free of snow all year round. Because it's hot and a lot of wind blows across the top, the snow can't linger there. So um, here's a picture of one of our guys um, on his last 50 to 100 feet heading up. <laughs> And uh, it, it does have a slight smell of sulfur up there. And you'll see um, on the edges of the crater steam vents. So this is all kind of surreal landscape. You know what I mean? It's an amazing place to be. All right. So that's the DC route. So going around the mountain to the north, there's another glacier called the Emmons. And it's quite a massive uh, glacier. It's the biggest in mass on the mountain. And it's the first route that I climbed in uh, 2002. Um, one of the appealing things about that route is that it's quite the same as the DC in terms of difficulty. It's not much longer. It doesn't require technical climbing. Um, but it also gets you right up close to amazingly huge crevasses, just like we experienced on the DC route. Um, the first time I'd ever seen large crevasses was on that route. And um, this is a picture of the sort of thing you're going to see. I've got another one that shows you the Bergschrund at the top, which is a literal canyon where this massive glacier pulls away from the summit. But because it's unmaintained, you're on your own. There's no flags. There's no bridges. There's no trail to speak of. Um, being the second most popular route in the mountain, about 10, 8 to 10 percent of all the people who go up there climb this one, and then the other 2 to 3 percent of people that climb the mountain, climb all the other like 20 routes on the mountain. So you're going to see so many people on the DC. You're going to see a sliver of them on the Emmons and every other route. You'll hardly see anybody. Um, so it's a great route to climb on. Um, one of the things, though, is that because even though there's only 10% people there, there are still quite a few rescues on this route because a lot of inexperienced people will climb it. So let's go on to the next one. So here's a um, picture of uh, what the Emmons entails. Some of the topography that's important on this side is Little Tahoma Peak. So uh, the DC route is over here. Okay. So um, you start over here in the White River Campground, come up Glacier Basin, and you'll come up to a place called the Interglacier. There's a diamond-shaped um, wedge, which on Mount Rainier they start. They call them all cleavers, you know, like the knife. Uh, a cleaver is that splits a glacier. And so this cleaver right here actually splits the Emmons Glacier and the Winthrop Glacier. Um, and right at the head of it is a little place called Camp Sherman, which is the north side equivalent of Camp Muir without all the nice things like toilets. Wow. <laughs> um, so your first leg is to go from, I believe, 4,400 um, up to... 
Camp Sherman, which is 9,400. So once again, you're going to have 5,000 foot ascent. Let's go to the next one. Um, and um, when you do that, you're going to cross this interglacier right here. So it is, in fact, a glacier, but it's receding quite a lot. I found this Google image which shows you how much it's receded. When I climbed it in 2002, it was about down here, and now it's even higher up. Um, this is the spot in which I experienced a lot of rock fall. Um, we had to dodge rocks, um, like the type where, you know, you're like, you hear something and you're looking up, okay, it's going to go left or right, you know, then you have to dodge out of the way, you know, basketball, golf ball, anything in between those size rocks. So that's one of the major hazards. So it's an exciting route. You get to rope up before you even get to Camp Sherman, climb across crevasses and dodge rocks. And then you get up to this ridge right here and climb around on this spine, looking down the massive crevasses at the end of the glacier for a while to get up to this head point. So it's exciting before you even get to the main base camp, which is one nice thing about it. and requires some good um, uh, navigational skills. Uh, Steamboat Prow is, is this point right here, and Camp Sherman is on the back side of it, hidden down this little gap. Um, camp Curtis is an abandoned camp. Well, not abandoned, but it's a not very used, very often one that's up here at 9,000 feet. You're going to pass that on the way. So that's some landmarks for you. Let's go to the next one. So here's a picture of Camp Sherman. Um, this is looking up at the remainder of the route. This would be the top of Liberty Cap over here, the Winter Glacier, and the upper sections of the Emmons, which are coming by. And let's go to the next one. It's a great picture. That's one I really like. This is the Steamboat Prow. Love wow. the clouds behind it and what it looks like up there. Um, you'll see all sorts of you know, uh, wind walls that have been built from climbers' efforts over the years. And there's this funky little shack right over here, which is about the size of a closet, which has an emergency phone and is locked. So <laughs> um, it's just a ranger shack. They have like a, uh, some rescue equipment in there and, you know, some ropes. It's just a what-if place. You can't sleep there. You can't get into it. There's no food. There's no water. There's no fuel. There's no toilets. Nothing. So you get this, you get this windy plateau. So a lot of people camp down on one side or the other to make sure they can avoid the, the wind that blows through this area. And you'll hear the glacier cracking at night and rocks falling off Little Tahoma. So it's pretty exciting. Go to the next page. So this is a picture of the way you need to go. Um, you go left and you go right because the way the glacier breaks, um, it'll create what's called a corridor at a certain elevation. And between, the, between that point, um, because of the prow, there's lateral crevasses that open up as the Emmons comes around. So when you're going up, you're actually crossing over crevasses that are oriented the same direction you are. So that's a dangerous situation. So you have to kind of move over to the left to avoid that situation. And then um, come up on the corridor and cross over to get up on the upper sections of the Winthrop and head up on the snow slopes where it's more safe. So the route will probably change year after year. And since it's been 13 years since I've climbed it, it might be different now, but this is um, some of the more broken sections down low. Um, pretty typical on the Winthrop. You know, it's real glacier route finding, but exciting. I meant the, the Emmons, the Emmons or the Winthrop. Continue up. So here's the, here's the big bad boy I was talking about. This is reminiscent of how big I remember the bear run being at the top. I thought when I, when I got up there, this is the last mother crevasse where it breaks away from the summit. I thought to myself, that is so big, I couldn't even throw a snowball across this thing. It's just incredibly wide and deep. So um, you're in for a treat if you like that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving around the mountain, on the edge of Winthrop is something called Curtis Ridge. And then we get to the far north side where there's the black and imposing and famous Willis Wall which is the death trap of Mount Rainier. Um, on the top of this is a glacier that sends Seracs careening thousands of feet, a thousand or two, down to the Carbon Glacier where they smash with impeding force here. And the Carbon Glacier is about 900 feet deep at this, at this hole down here where they all crash. And then it just accumulates and rolls on down. It's the lowest glacier on the mountain in terms of elevation that gets down to like 3,000 feet or something like that. Next to the Willis Wall, which is all broken, steep volcanic rock that's been ex you know, extensively excavated, is this Liberty Ridge route here. 
um, which is one of the more advanced routes in the mountain and considered to be a North American mountaineering classic. It's one of the longest known and highest routes in uh, the United States. And it was published in this famous book called 50 Crowded Climbs, I mean 50 Classic yeah. Climbs <laughs> of North America. <laughs> any, any route that gets published in that book it's in, got immediately famous and has thereafter been full of people. Um, so next to it is the Liberty Wall and Ptarmigan Ridge. So of course there's routes all over this. There's, there's actually four established routes in the Wells Wall, all of which are taking your life in your hands. Um, Liberty Ridge itself is still very tough, but isn't quite as insane. And there's other routes in between that and Ptarmigan Ridge, which is another route like Liberty. So just to get a sense of the north side, that's what we got going on. Let's turn to the next one. So here's a great picture of Liberty Ridge, which I found um, off of Summit Post. The various ways to come on the route. Um, there's a camp called Thumb Rock and some difficult climbing through here. And then another one called the Black Pyramid, which is a, a prominent location um, on the route to kind of know where you're at. And then the Bergschrund and finally Liberty Cap at 14.1. So most parties carry over this route and do it in two days. And it's some steep ice climbing. You have dangers of seracs. Um, you have weather that can come in. Um, one of the many times people have been trapped on this route and they can't go up or down. So, um, of course, I'm interested in climbing it someday, and I'm, there's others who are, who are also, but you can, the conditions have to be right. I mean, it's a grade three, four, 55 degree ice. It's a toughie. Um, but climbing Liberty Ridge is kind of the um, the capstone of your of your career as a climber, as for average humans, your career career as a climber. I'm not going to like probably just the access, just the beginning of the route wouldn't be that great because there's not that many roads over there, right? Yeah, you have to come in on the north side, hiking quite a ways, and cross the Carbon Glacier just to begin your ascent. So, but as it is, there you go. So, if that that's your cup of tea, it's waiting for you. Let's go to the next one. Um, on moving around the mountain to the northwest side would be the Mauch face. And you can see on this side there are seracs that hang around all over here, which is uh, it's where a glacier gets so steep that it actually breaks off and descends catastrophically to lower elevations. So you've got these hanging ice cliffs, um, which are looming above you with tons of avalanche debris ready to smash you. So you need to be sure, certain that you know what you're climbing on this side. Now which face is here, that's the probably the safest route. Um, but these have been climbed and ski all over this side of the mountain. So I didn't put anything specifically here because they're so rarely climbed that you should just go to a guidebook and look it up. But they're all there, anything you want. If you want a wilderness experience, this is the side to be on. I'm sort of curious, like when you were there, like did you hear these noises and sounded sort of like sonic booms? No, that your noises that sound like sonic booms is the question. Yeah. Um, what's the follow up? Well, the, you know, like I, I said, wow, I don't see the airplanes, but I, you know, like I asked someone, I said, see, it sounds like sonic booms, and they were saying it was like big ice things falling off the mountain. Oh, okay, the seracs falling in the crevasses opening. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we heard that. Yeah, you know, because I thought, where's the plane at? You know, I was yeah. a plane flying over it. And said, oh, it's, that's, that's not planes, that's like big. It must be really big, I guess, to make that kind of sound. They are. And the mountain is active. You know, it's, it's got glaciers um, cracking and moving all the time and ice cliffs that are falling. So during the time that we were on the mountain, we saw multiple um, sloughs, mini avalanches, um, you know, seracs falling in some de to some degree, fresh slides, rock fall, all that stuff happened. So... It's, it can be dangerous. You just need to know um, how to avoid that sort of a thing. So on the Tahoma Glacier, this is another one that I spent two years trying to climb and still was unsuccessful due to large crevasses. Um, it's long, it's wild, and you'll never see a person over there. Um, they've got some amazing names like Backstage Pass and Sunset Amphitheater. Um, this cleaver here, the Piala Cleaver and St. Andrew's Rock are all places that you feel like you're the only person there in the mountain. You got the whole place to yourself. This is a uh, point success in Columbia Crest here. You can see that the Tahoma Glacier spills down in a chaotic mess from quite a long ways. So the two years that I went there, one, one year we came through the glacier like this and were stopped at right about there by a huge bear trunk. 
And the second year, we came around this side and went up this spine, made base camp here, dropped onto the glacier, and came up here and were stopped by another huge bear shrine that we couldn't get across. <laughs> that was the point I said, okay, no more. I'm not wasting my time with that route. So it's a toughie. Um, you can do anything you want over here. You can climb classified rock, you can do steep ice, you can do glacier travel, you can do snow. And uh, it's another side of the mountain that doesn't get much attention. This is the side that the historic Lahars came through. You can see how this mountain has been really eroded. And it's the side that you see from Seattle. When you, when you fly by in the plane, you also see it. Let's go to the next one. Oh, and well, there's a picture from our climb. So that's me. Um, and the, one neat thing I like to tell about this route is that one of my best experiences in the mountains that was kind of a neat one for me was when we were here on the second year, there's a, there's a spot here where the ice cliff is amazingly huge and um, very old remnant snow is hanging out here above this. And I wish I had a picture of it, I should have taken one, but I actually counted all of the winters, of the, the dark bands and the light bands, and I was born in 1973, and there was, more, there was more winters there than I was old. So I was looking at ice on the mountain that was there before I was born. So that was really cool to see. And it's, it's an ancient place. You know, that, when you see that kind of thing, you realize that it's uh, got a lot more power than, it's just more than just a big lump of rock. So that's the glaciers on that side. So going around the other way, this is what we're just looking at here. This is the Tahoma. This is the South Tahoma where the plane is, is uh, entombed. Um, this is canyon thing. Yeah, and you're not allowed to climb in here out of respect. So the, all the climbing routes there are closed. They don't get much traffic anyway. Um, this is the success cleaver. You can see just by looking at it, there's going to be a number of rock and ice routes that one can do there. Um, I don't have them memorized, and I didn't want to point them out individually for the sake of time, but there's many guidebooks, um, one which I just passed to you guys. Could I have that back? Let me just feature that real quick, that orange one on the end of the, end of the table there. This is the one I recommend, um, Mount Rainier, a climbing guide by Mike Gaudier. Um, it's, uh, I've gotten most of my information from this book, and it's a good one to, to own, so I recommend that guy. Okay, so success cleaver is best in early season because of all the rock fall danger. So if you're looking for a burly um, late winter route to climb, that's the one. Go ahead and get the next one. Okay, so now we get to talk about the Cow Glacier route, which I personally experienced just a week or so ago. I've been looking at this route for a number of years, and this year when SMC climbed it, we decided to uh, take a two-prong approach. We wanted to have a team that both teams start from paradise and one descend ascend rather the couch route to the summit and one ascend the DC route to the summit. Shake hands, hurrah, hurrah, and then both teams come down the DC route. <laughs> so as it turned out, we didn't start, our team on the couch didn't start here. We actually started over here on recommendation of the ranger to avoid the very broken disqualification. So that, in talking with climbers, seems to be one of the major things, like where do you start this route? Do you go over on the Squally? Do you start somewhere else in Traverse Inn? Um, we were really happy, even though we added more to our total elevation to start down at Connell Falls, but um, many teams do do this route here, which crosses in the Squally, where you have to rope up literally from Paradise to get up there. The other question about the Cal's route is whether you're going to carry over your gear and descend the DC route or wrap down, rappel back down the ice cliffs and descend the way you came. So we opted for the DC route because we knew we had another team over there and I knew that way. And it seemed like if you could just get to the summit, then you can relax when you come back down. So, but uh, when we were there, um, there was a guided a team that was doing just the reverse. They would build V screws or V threads in the ice on the ice chute and just, uh, wrapped down a number of rope lengths until they got back to camp. So if you choose to do the uh, route that we did, you're up for a 10,800 foot ascent, which is quite a lot. And then a 9,000 foot descent to Camp Muir. And um, it's kind of a challenging route, but it's moderate ice climbing, so it's not like Levi, where you're gonna be going up 90 degree ice. Um, this is real glacier ice, so it's very hard. Go ahead and go to the next one. Here's a picture that was taken from our team of the ice. Um, you're going to start with uh, starting at uh, 
Comet Falls and going up 7,600 feet to Camp Hazard. So that took us about 12 hours. Camp Hazard is 11,300. It's not hazardous. It's named after the first ascent person who was Mr. Hazard. Okay. <laughs> However, you are looking at ice cliffs the whole time you're there, and they will be sending down bits of debris, or not more than more than bits. Um, so the second leg summit day would be from Camp Hazard, leaving early in the morning and climbing these ice chutes in the darkness um, at up to 50 degrees or so until you get to the Couts, the upper section of the Couts Glacier, weaving through huge crevasses and then on your way. If you decide to carry over, you've got a 4,200% camp near, and um, you need to have some days built in for weather. So we allocated a week. Anytime you climb out right here, you should have about a week's worth of time. It might take you two, three days to climb, but you might get weathered out for another day or so. So build in a week. Let's go to the next one. So here's our little photo essay going up from um, Comet Falls to Camp Hazard. It has the same sorts of meadows as Paradise with all the wildflowers and the alpine fir, but without all the asphalt trails and tourist toting cameras. Go ahead and head to the next one. Um, this is a picture from our tent at Camp Hazard 11,300 after we climbed up through the snow and um, traversed on the edge of the Wilson Glacier. What an amazing view. And we can see Mount Adams right here in the distance, which is a 12,000-foot volcano just south of right here. Let's head to the next one. So is the camp area that small, or is that just an area? The question was, is the camp area that small, or is this just an area? This is just one area. You can see the edge of another tent here. It could Camp Hazard can probably house about... 20 tents, but they're all in little um, dugout uh, spots peppered all over a fairly steep slope of rock. So this is the largest cluster of the largest tents we could find. We had three three-man tents. No, we had uh, two three-man and two and one two-person tents. We needed three spots. There were four there, so it was great. Um, daylight picture, the night, you know, this was the day we got there. The sun was going down. You can see one of our climbers here. You can see how broken the ice cliffs are, and then the ice shoots themselves. So it's it has this raked nature because it's it's icy, and so water melts and runs down the runnels and then freezes again. But it also crosses a few minor crevasses along the way, so it's somewhat dirty and icy, and weird sort of climbing. But it's all hard granular ice. So this was the first pitch, then you walk through, and the second pitch. We'll go to the next picture here. No, oh, I didn't include a picture of the actual climbing itself, so that was all I had. But this is on the upper counts. Um, the glaciers you go through after that are pretty large, just like they are everywhere else in the mountain. So at this point, we're about three hours into the climb. We left at four, which was too, probably too late, 4 a.m. Here's some perspective on the upper Couts Glacier. We were looking back and got a snapshot of a team of four on the DC route. Yes, those are people right there. <laughs> you can see these massive crevasses and the weather that's always there threatening you on the horizon. So um, the Couts route actually crosses the Couts Cleaver and connects with the Nisqually Glacier and then connects up to the DC route. Or you can turn a sharp left after you get off the ice chutes and climb up to a point success, and then go to the crater. Either way, both ways were done by our teams. One team went left, and the other two teams went right. So I have a few things about glaciers. Um, as we're uh, going around the mountain, we just circumnavigated all of the routes. So I thought it would be prudent to talk about glacier climbing on Mount Rainier. So to do that, I finally made good on my promise of bringing a Snickers bar to explain how glaciers work. So why this? Because they have this wonderful chocolate coating on the outside, which functions somewhat like a glacier. So glaciers are formed and deformed by their slide down a mountain. And they're rivers of ice. So this is a river of chocolate, okay? Just a little bit more scrumptious than a river.
must be an energy drink. So the computer went to sleep. <laughs> so I, I talked too long and the screen is fast enough. Okay, so it's live now. And Okay. There we go. Okay. So we should be up again. Sorry about that delay. Um, so here's some parts of a glacier. This is the accumulation zone with the crevasses. The firm line is very evident right here, the zone between the two. And this is the ablation zone where everything is very icy and bare. And then the moraine down here. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, some of the hazards you might see on a glacier, obviously crevasses. Uh, the Bergschrund is the mother crevasse at the top. Um, a serac is where crevasses crisscross and create isolated blocks of ice that fall, or perhaps where there's an ice cliff and the glacier is breaking off in chunks and falling down. Um, an ice fall is a place where there's many seracs, also known as an ice cliff. And there's another interesting feature called a moomin, which is a well. Um, it's where water runs down the glacier and then goes into a crevasse. So if you slide into one of those, you're going underground and you're going to drown. Um, so I'm going to talk about these, concavity, convexity, tensile strength, and compression. Can you go to the next slide to see what I have? Is it? Yeah, go ahead and go back. So um, I will use my Snickers bar now. Okay, so we can see what's going on. Um, let's catch some lights here. So this is our yonder glacier. Um, when it goes over a hump, which would mean a concavity, okay, concave, okay, it's going to bend like this. Oh, look at that crevasse that just happened right there. Yeah. Okay. And as it continues to do so, it will create more of them. So uh, it's going to bust. You're going to see all the gooey caramel inside. I mean, ice inside of the glacier. Right. So that's what happens when it's concave. Now. When it comes to some place that's convex, it's going to bend the other way. The crevasses are going to are going to close up and go back this way. Okay, so that's that bar. Okay, now when it goes around corners, something else will happen. You can imagine what I'm going to do. So, um, as it goes around a bend, it's going to bust on the side, and the crevasses are going to come in from the edge. Okay. You can see this. Okay, so that's what happens when it goes around. So when you're climbing a glacier, you want to stay on the inside of that bend. Okay, not on the outside. So there you go. So that's the demo. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and turn this. Turn this Wait, light off. Some <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so the pit. So the the. Strategy is you want to figure out where the crevasses are going to be and link those zones up. So anytime you see a glacier going over a bulge, you want to try to stay to the left, the right of that, where it's going to be in a valley, if possible. And if you see a glacier that's being stretched like this, that's a good safe place rather than a glacier that's being stretched like this. Okay. So link up those zones of compression. And um, the time of day near you go is important. Early, cold. That's why an alpine start in a glacier usually means midnight or one or two. And um, you should record your route as you go up. So a GPS would be good or wands, flags, those would be useful. You can't rely on being able to see because you might get socked in. So let's head on to the next one. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about clothing and equipment for Rainier, which is an important um, aspect. But um, given how much time we have, I'm not going to give pull out many examples. I'm just going to use this primarily. So um, there's three categories, I think, that belong in your bag of tricks. One of them is your clothing, which you should consider safety equipment. And then there's your equipment, which is what you use to do the climbing, or you use to do the camping, rather. And then your gear, which is your tools for climbing. Okay, so that's how I break it up. Um, these materials are the types that you want for clothing. You want to avoid cotton, 
you want to stick with man-made materials or wool um, or down, um, which I did not have on there. Um, but polyester, propylene, spandex, nylon, all that stuff is good because it wicks water, doesn't retain water, and it dries out faster than natural materials. Um, your, your recommended layer system is good because you want to have a way to vent moisture and also retain heat and, and change the thickness of your, of your buffer between you and the environment for that to be accomplished. So let's go to the next one. So here's the idea. You've got base layer, you've got mid layer, and you've got shell layer. Shell layer is supposed to keep the moisture from, per, uh, from penetrating. The insulating layer, the mid layer, and the middle is supposed to provide distance between your base layer and your shell layer. An exchange of air is important there. And your base layer is right up next to your skin. Its main purpose is to provide a little bit of warmth, mostly to wick water away from your skin. So none of those layers work like they scientifically are described in the brochures that you read in the glossy magazines. There's a lot of crossover and messiness with all of these, but as, um, as you know, uh, Un, we just take the system as it is, you know, and we work with what we got. So um, ideally you want these layers to be thin and breathable, you want these to be large and, and have distance, and you want these to be impermeable to water and wind. So go ahead and go to the next one. There's a couple examples of some things that you want that we, we have available here at Bobcats. Um, you know, wool socks or synthetic socks, that are warm gaiters and sometimes liners. These are some examples of uh, types of manufacturers that offer those sorts of items. Let's head to the next one. Um, one one way to do the base layer thing is to start with a short sleeve, thin, and then add another little more insulating layer on top of that with a zip neck. Um, those two together, I often consider to be the base layer system, even though it's actually two pieces. And so I can actually I can mix or match or combine them to make my base layer thicker if I wish to. And then for bottoms, you know, it's up to you whether you want to do something that's above the knee or below. It depends on how much insulation you want. Let's head to the next one. The mid layer is the one that has the most flexibility because it could be fleece, could be wool. It could be spandex, it could be polypro, it could be nylon, it could be all kinds of things. So one thing that I recommend nowadays is to buy soft shell, which is a stretchy, warm, water-resistant fabric. And uh, it also functions somewhat as a jacket, unless the weather's really bad. And depending on the thickness you have, it's quite breathable, much more breathable than coated nylon. And um, uh, they often have you know, uh, zip that full zip, long sleeves, same thing with your pants. It'd be nice to get zips so you can vent. Um, the same sorts of names appear. All of these, almost all of these are available here. The main ones are these here that we like. Um, let's head to the next one. So your shell layer is your most expensive layer and also the one that you're going to use the least. <laughs> How ironic. So I wouldn't spend a lot of money on it. I'd get something that is uh, works for when the conditions are really bad and you don't mind having in your pack for a while. For a while. Um, but definitely windproof, water resistant at the least, and waterproof if you can afford it. Absolutely has to have a hood. Absolutely has to have a full zip, I believe, for venting. Pit zips and chest zips and Velcro closures are optional. Um, you don't need powder skirts and extra cord. Um, thingies for your iPad, iPod, and all sorts of other fancy items, but as long as, long as it is fairly long and windproof and water resistant, that's the key. And then for your pants, full zip again is key, and that it fits underneath the harness. Also, you're going to shred the lower parts of your pants with your crampon, so get something that's fairly durable to last as long as you can. Let's head to the next one. So this is a balaclava which covers your entire face, and you can you can install goggles and everything will be covered by your nose. This would be the the uh, the toque or the toboggan hat. And you can bring your warm hat. Um, that should do it about there. Let's head to the next one. 
Glacier glasses are important with wraparounds. You don't get fried here. They need to be really um, capture a lot of UV and cut down the glare. And then goggles are sometimes needed as well. Full length gauntlet gloves up to halfway up your arm um, with uh, probably a, a grippy palm of some sort, the ability to cinch them down so that you can grip things. You're going to have to manipulate carabiners and ropes and jacket zips. And if you really need it, then you can go with mittens, which oftentimes can fit over the gloves. So make sure you have a system of liners, midweight, and shell for your hands, just like you do for your body. I think that's important. Is that the next one? One key um, item of, of clothing that a lot of climbers have that some backpackers and hikers might not use is something called a belay jacket. So this is when you're at the belay where the rope's paying out or someone's on lead or you're even just taking a break, you have this big jacket with hopefully with a hood you can put on over everything to keep you warm. And then um, when it's time to start moving again, you just take that jacket off and stuff it in your pack. So it's really versatile. And down is a good fabric, is a good fill to use if you don't, if you can find a way to keep it from getting wet or, and or you don't mind the cost, <laughs> but it lasts a long time and it's very compressible for its warmth. Um, soft shell is also, a, a, like I mentioned, is a really great thing to have. And, um, you know, between these two, waterproof and wind resistant, and water resistant. Um, I think that windproof is probably the most important, and then water resistant is next, and then waterproof is third. So, de depending on what's most important to you, um, don't go automatically to Gore Tex triple ply waterproof because that means very little breathability. Think about breathability first. Let's go to the next one. So, in terms of equipment, I wouldn't bring this much terrain air if I were him. I think I could cut a few of those items out. Um, some of the things you want to try are somewhere around a 40 liter pack, but you will need a four season tent. Um, you're going to need a sleeping bag ready to 15 degrees or warmer and a white gas stove or another reliable type stove that's powerful enough to melt water, to melt snow into water, and then possibly a shovel, altimeter, GPS, tracking poles, those sorts of items because it's snowy and cold and nasty up there a lot. So you want something that will work for you. Said the next one. Um, pack types we're looking at around 40 to 55. A lot of people on the mountain are heading uphill with 70 liter packs. I consider that to be a mistake. I think that's too big and it'll slow you down. And if you can really just bring your kit down to an amount where you can fit it into a 40 or even at the most a 50, that would be much more effective. Um, you want to be able to strip it down for climbing if you can, so you could actually carry a big pack up to base camp and then strip down, take the top lid off and strip down layers and pull the waist belt out and cut a pound or two off, but that's an option. Let's go to the next one. Sleeping bags and sleeping mats, important to have something that's going to get you off the snow and keep you warm. So whether it's down or synthetic doesn't necessarily matter. The point is keep it from getting wet. Because um, even synthetic, they say, oh, it's warm when wet. No, it's less miserable than down when wet, okay? So they're all miserable when they get wet. It's just that down is, is more expensive, it's more compressible, and lasts longer. But synthetic is a bag that you could buy and kick it around and not have to worry about it much. So they're both useful. Um, I did carry an emergency bivouac sack on the mountain. And I only used one sleeping bag, um, not sleeping bag liner, but sleeping mat. However, it's the somewhat thick type, the new inflatable Neo Airs. Those are amazing. So in the past, I might have taken an Insulite pad and an inflatable pad both, but now I just take one big, big monster inflatable. So they're getting smaller and smaller. The sleeping mats you can get nowadays are about like this, about that wide and about this, about this big. So, all right, go to the next. Okay, for tents, really double or single wall. Um, we took three single wall tents up on the couch route because we had to carry them over. So our two person tent weighed about four pounds and our three person, four season Himalayan grade EV3s weigh about six pounds. So that's great shelter for three people, two pounds a piece. That was the ticket. But they need to be four season, they need to have all their guy lines and they should be staked out. Um, some folks who were honest with the couch route 
and other folks I've talked with have seen or have experienced the unfortunate incident of having their tents actually blown off the mountain by winds or by avalanche blasts or buried by snow, so they need to be strong and guide, them, guide out. Let's head to the next one. So equipment, um, here's the two types that I see most often. This is an XGKEX expedition mountaineering stove, which burns white gas and all kinds of other fuel. It's really strong, it's very reliable, it will burn for a long time. With this bottle, you can keep continual pressure on it, so it'll give you firepower to the very last drop. Another type, which is not as useful of a how-to, but it's certainly compact and popular, is something like this canister stove jet one type. But the pot on top of it doesn't melt water very, doesn't, doesn't melt very much snow, so you'll be continually putting that in there. And as the can drains, it'll have less firepower as it gets to the bottom. So, yeah, and they don't work so well when they're cold, but they both have their place. Let's head to the next. In terms of food, um, a lot of people were using something like this in the mountain because it was very lightweight. Um, we wouldn't necessarily bring this because it's got water in it, but some of these packaged meals would say you can microwave them. You could just put them in a boiling stove, boiling pot, and that's good enough. <laughs> Dry food is always really popular. Um, we're looking for um, freeze-dry, pre-cooked, or dry no cook type meals where you can just add boiling water to it and it'll rehydrate. Other than that, come to the wrapper. Here's some other items you're going to want. The map, the good headlamp, the altimeter, a good knife, a collapsible water bottle, compass, and some other things that are important. Lip balm is key. My lips get fried every time I'm out in the mountain. And lots of sunscreen. Um, you're going to need your blue bag, you might want to bring a cell phone potentially. There is actually coverage at Camp Mirror, but there's none at Paradise, surprisingly. <laughs> so, um, a first aid kit for your team, a shovel to dig to dig out tents, and don't forget the pack mojo. All right? Yeah, mojo. So you can get to the top. All right. Um, for in terms of climbing gear, what we're looking at are stiff waterproof mountaineering boots. A lightweight pack. This is your puffy, your your blade jacket, an ice tool or an ice axe, a good set of gloves, and a pair of crampons. Um, these are all essential items which you're going to need for mountain climbing. You don't have to have ice tools, however. Um, if you're not climbing anything, it's ice. Mountain Max will do just fine. So let's head to the next one. Here's some examples of boots. Some people climb in double plastics, which are very warm uh, but heavy. Um, you could go with something lighter weight, like this three-quarter shank, uh, three-season mountaineering boot. I used those for my first couple of cents on Rainier. But this last time, I took a pair of full shank um, insulated boots. My feet were much happier. I didn't have to worry about them getting cold. And I climbed ice a lot more confidently. So you probably want uh, something that's a mountaineering boot. You can't get away with just hiking boots. Go ahead to the next. Crampons, 10, 12, and 14 point will work. You don't have to have ice climbing crampons. Those with just the standard, um, well, these are actually ice climbing. With, with the standard um, flat horizontal points would be just fine for most routes. And then a mountain axe that's sharp. And all of your items should be sharp. It was uh, it was uh, fun to see everybody sharpening their tools the night before we went up on the couch. <laughs> we were talking about the shoot and everything. And I was saying, you know, one of the things that gives me confidence is sharp tools. You know, you bring the files out, everyone's just firing away. So that's true, though. Keep your tools sharp. A, a nice lightweight harness will, will work just fine in a small diameter rope, eight millimeters. Um, we climbed on uh, 7.8 and 8.4 millimeter ropes on the couch. And on the uh, DC, they use 7.7 .7 millimeter ropes. So they're real thick. And assorted runners and cord and slingage. Um, we go through all this stuff in our snow, ice, and glacier climbing classes and our rock climbing courses too. So um, you guys will hear this from me many times. But um, anytime we're going climbing, we want to make sure all the gear is in order and that we have the right selections. So if you climb with us, we hope you find that stuff. Let's head to the next one. Some more carabiners. You need a locker D with a smooth stock like this manual locking HMS compatible pestle. And then a wire gate, nice lightweight wire gate, and a picket. We have a, a picket and an eye screw, a couple lockers, a few slings, and um, that would do it for everybody on 
glacier travel for safety. Let's send the next one. Here's a picture of an ice room. And we did actually carry a little bit of rock gear just in case, but didn't need it there. We used it on Mount Adams a couple days later. But even on mountains like Rainier, sometimes we'll bring um, some of this stuff. Primarily, however, it's going to be pickets and ice crews that you're going to use for protection. So that is it um, for the Mount Rainier presentation. So let's do some questions. You guys have any? And I'll restate them if you do. <laughs> Or did we cover I'll, everything? I'll, I'll start. I'll start from just out of curiosity. Like when you came down the disappointment cleaver route, yeah. Like did they have a lot of fixed lines, like especially in the rocky sections? Question was when we came down the disappointment cleaver route, did they have a lot of fixed lines, specifically in yeah. the rocky sections? Yeah. Um, there were about six to seven ladders. Two of them had um, hand lines. There were two more fixed lines down steep sections, and during the the rocky section down Disappointment Cleaver. This time, there were no, uh, there were no fixed lines. Oh. However, when I climbed it in 2012, there were two. Oh. So what happens is, as the nature of the route changes, even where they enter and exit Disappointment Cleaver, the route itself changes in risk. Right. And so wherever RMI and IMG decide that their clients are experiencing higher risk, they'll install something. So that makes it interesting that you could go climb this route like we did in 2012 and come back three years later and have a completely different experience. The DC route was way over on the other side of the Ingram Glacier this year. Huh. So it was terrain I had never even looked at from before. It was it was around it was around the side. They went farther to the east. Uh, they went farther to the west. Farther west. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they were actually uh, almost on the Nisqually Glacier. Wow. Yeah, they went that far west. So okay. Yeah, good question. Any others? Yeah, uh, the the ascent takes uh, three days on on the what is it? Petzl about Couts. Couts. Yeah, the ascent takes three days on the couts. Yes, it takes three days on all routes. Uh, That's what you should allocate if you have absolute certainty that you're going to have no bad weather. Um, but you really want to plan for five. Because you just never know. Um, we've gotten real lucky in 2012 when we climbed it. The 18 hours where there wasn't any rain happened to be the exact time frame that we were motoring towards the top. It rained on our way up to Camp Mir the day before, and it rained the next three days after we got off the mountain. But just in that one day <laughs> where we were moving up, there was no rain. And then this year when we went back, we had uh, great weather for four days. There was clear hot weather which is very uncharacteristic of Mount Rainier so we were able to do it again so don't plan on it though it's weather will get you so any other questions okay all right we're going to close up so thanks for viewing and uh, SMC is www.smc.club or sierramountaineeringclub.org and for paid members, you can view this um, every time we broadcast the seminar. Thanks, you guys, for coming. Yeah. And we'll close up.